This is Eddie Muller. Thanks for joining me again in Noir Alley, where I am ready to kiss off this lousy year faster than a femme fatale drops a penniless sap. I'm also celebrating because today is the Noir Alley premiere of the film that really started it all, Double Indemnity. Now, I'm not claiming, of course, that this is the first film noir, but it is the essential film noir, the one that broke the dam and inspired the flood of crime and murder movies comprising the film noir era. Now, the reason for its influence is simple. Not only did the film earn critical acclaim, it was a huge box office hit, a far more significant factor when it comes to setting trends in Hollywood. And as usual, I'm going to start with the writer. In 1934, during the depths of the Depression, former newspaper man and flailing screenwriter James M. Cain wrote a slim, suspenseful novel called The Postman Always Rings Twice. This tawdry tale of lust, adultery, and murder became a surprise bestseller. MGM was compelled to buy the rights, even though there was no chance of it being made under the oversight of a newly reinforced production code. In 1936, Kane wrote a slightly different version of the same story, serialized in Liberty magazine. Now, it wasn't published in book form until 1943, with two other novellas in a volume called Three of a Kind. And by that time, veteran screenwriter Billy Wilder had begun directing pictures at Paramount. He'd made the comedy The Major and the Minor and the World War II drama Five Graves to Cairo. And although provocative humor was his forte, Wilder had another ambition, to create a thriller to rival the best of fellow emigre Alfred Hitchcock, whose recent hits Rebecca, Suspicion, and Foreign Correspondent earned him the title Master of Suspense. Paramount producer Joe Sistrom brought Wilder a copy of Three of a Kind in galley form prior to its publication, suggesting that it might be suitable grist. Wilder gave it to his secretary to read. Legend has it, she went MIA that afternoon, only to be discovered in a stall in the ladies' room, devouring a nasty little tale of sex, murder, and betrayal that Kane called double indemnity. Wilder was sold, but his usual writing partner, Charles Brackett, was not. Brackett was an East Coast blue blood who found Kane's work lurid and vulgar and he refused to cooperate on it. This was a blow for Billy, because his writing process required a colleague, somebody with whom he could hash out the story and bounce around ideas. Well, Joe Sistrom suggested a guy whose detective novels he enjoyed, Raymond Chandler, an oil company executive. Chandler had begun writing only after he was fired for chronic drinking. His three novels were pieced together from short stories he'd written in the 30s for the pulp magazine Black Mask. Chandler was now 55, married to a woman 20 years his senior. He was uptight unless well-oiled and trying hard to hide his alcoholism. Wilder was 37, witty, randy, and wildly ambitious. All they had in common was that they were both snide and sarcastic, and they agreed that James M. Cain wrote lousy dialogue. Serviceable on the page, but stilted and lifeless on an actor's lips. So, cooped up in Wilder's office, the two wrote together. Even though Chandler typically worked in isolation, nursing a bottle and imagining himself as tough, sardonic, private eye Philip Marlowe, Wilder, the prince of Paramount, strutted around, slashing a riding crop through the air gleefully dominating his collaborator, who'd sneak into the men's room for doses of liquid courage. They despised each other. Now, within a few weeks, however, they'd created a screenplay that would revolutionize motion pictures. Here was a story in which the principal characters were cold and cunning, driven by lust and greed and an existential ennui never before seen on screen. Yes, I killed him. I killed him for money, and for a woman. And I didn't get the money, and I didn't get the woman. Wilder relished defying the production code, making a film specifically about how and why people 
commit murder. He believed audiences would delight in watching bad people do bad things. And Chandler abetted him by turning Cain's blunt prose into hard-boiled poetry. They both imbued this cruel story with a streak of mordant humor that made it all the more squeamishly entertaining. Another stroke of Wilder's subversive genius was casting as murderers a pair of popular actors audiences loved for their humor. Barbara Stanwyck was coming off two classic comedies, The Lady Eve and Ball of Fire, and she'd previously co-starred with Fred McMurray in the charming romance Remember the Night. And she initially begged off playing the role of a calculating killer, and Wilder challenged her by saying, I'm sorry, I thought you were an actress. What do you want me to do? I want you to be nice to me. Like the first time you came to the house. Can't be like the first time. Something's happened. I know it has. It's happened to us. After their collaboration, Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler parted the worst of enemies, but not before Wilder acknowledged Chandler's contribution by giving him a cameo, waiting outside Barton Keyes' office at the Pacific All Risk Insurance Company. The double indemnity script would be nominated for an Oscar, and Chandler never forgave Wilder for not inviting him to the ceremony. Double Indemnity was nominated for seven Academy Awards in all, including Best Picture. The irony is that Wilder would win both Best Screenplay and Best Director the following year for the Best Picture winner, The Lost Weekend, a movie about an alcoholic writer, largely inspired by his collaboration with Raymond Chandler. The noir movement in Hollywood officially began September 7, 1944 when Paramount Pictures opened Double Indemnity nationwide. It is 74 years later, and I'm hoping some of you have not seen this film, because I'm honored to introduce to you the definitive film noir, Double Indemnity. The success of Double Indemnity proved that American audiences didn't need to be patronized with moral uplift and happily ever after endings. They could take the 100 proof stuff and not choke on it. Billy Wilder proved that human beings giving in to their worst impulses can be very entertaining, provided the tawdry tale is brilliantly told. Oh yeah, the Oscar for Best Picture that year went to Going My Way. The industry has always hedged its bets. Even more ridiculous is that Edward G. Robinson, who gives one of the greatest supporting performances ever, was not one of this picture's seven Oscar nominations. I think Papa has it all figured out. Figured out and wrapped up in tissue paper with pink ribbons on it. Double Indemnity didn't win a single award, by the way. Instead, Wilder settled for a significant consolation prize, changing the course of movie history. Billy Wilder is, in my estimation, the finest writer-director ever, but I will never describe this as a Billy Wilder picture or Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity. There are just too many essential collaborators. Raymond Chandler, Joe Sistrom, director of photography John Seitz, composer Miklas Roja, and all the actors. James M. Cain's source novel isn't as good as The Postman Always Rings Twice, but he deserves full marks for erecting the foundation upon which all of Dark City was built. But consider Cain's version of Walter first laying eyes on Phyllis. A woman was standing there. I'd never seen her before. She was maybe 31 or two with a sweet face, light blue eyes, and dusty blonde hair. She was small and had on a suit of blue house pajamas. She had a washed out look. There's no wrought iron staircase, no terry cloth towel, no anklet. Kane's strategy was to make his murderers utterly ordinary. Well, that wasn't going to wash in Hollywood especially not in the hands of a director determined to be on par with Hitchcock and Lubitsch. Reworked by Wilder and Chandler, Walter and Phyllis shimmer with fatal allure from the moment they appear on screen. Everything you love about Double Indemnity is in this script, a masterful example of the screenwriter's art, at least up till sequence D, an alternate ending never shot, 
in which Walter Neff actually professes his love for Barton Keys. Better, but only slightly, is another alternate ending, sequence E, which was shot, in which Keys watches as Walter is executed in the gas chamber. Now, for decades, there's been speculation that the Death House ending might be recovered. It's become a holy grail for many noir fanatics. Well, here's the good news. Sequence E is still missing. If it is discovered and reinserted, Billy Wilder will come back from the grave to haunt everyone involved. He always maintained the scene was cut because the narrative ends emotionally with Walter bleeding out beside the surrogate father he's betrayed. End of story. Now, my theory is that the gas chamber scene was included solely to appease the Breen office, which would have rejected the script if Walter wasn't explicitly punished for his crimes. According to former Paramount archivist Barry Allen, the gas chamber scene will never be found. It may, through some fluke, be discovered in a place where it ended up by mistake. But we've looked for it for years, and we have to assume it was destroyed. But God forbid Wilder kept Kane's original ending. Walter and Phyllis escape justice, but on a steamship headed to Mexico, they throw themselves overboard in a suicide pact to be devoured by a marauding shark. For the record, Kane loved the changes made by Wilder and Chandler, especially the dictaphone setting up the flashbacks and the stronger bond between Neff and Keyes. Kane conceded the film was better than his book. Over the years, the only consistent complaint I've heard about this picture, and it comes from many self-professed noirholics, involves Barbara Stanwyck's wig. It's cheap, obvious, and poorly styled. Well, yeah. It's Phyllis, personified. Now, don't believe the tale that Wilder regretted the wig halfway through filming, but couldn't start over. He knew what he was doing. The falseness of the hair and Walter's willingness to look right past it explains both characters perfectly. More annoying are guys who knock Stanwyck's lack of sex appeal. Generally, these arrested adolescents say stupid things like, I want to like this film, but I can't believe a guy would kill for that chick. She's not even a little bit hot. Well, this isn't even worthy of comment, since Stanwyck could, of course, break these boys like matchsticks. But it does point up a common misconception, that double indemnity is about a femme fatale sexually coercing a man into committing murder. Let's get it straight. That's not what this film is about. Walter Neff's real motive isn't a dalliance with Mrs. Dietrichson. It's proving that he can beat the house, that Barton Keyes' infallible actuarial tables do not apply to him. The affair between Phyllis and Walter is less about sexual attraction than it is about a pair of schemers coldly manipulating each other. The real love story and the genuine heartbreak is between Neff and Keyes. All right. That's it for Double Indemnity. Keep up with us on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed, and come back next week when we start a fresh calendar year by taking a vacation to Mexico with Robert Mitchum and Jane Russell and his kind of woman, with Vincent Price aboard for good measure. Now, I've been invited to ring in the new year at Ben Mankiewicz's bungalow, along with my fellow TCM hosts, Alicia Malone and Dave Carger. I hope that you can join us tomorrow night as we say goodbye to 2018 and hello to a new year with something decidedly non-noir, an all-that's-entertainment lineup. The champagne will be flowing, but I may have to get behind the bar and spike things up a little bit. See you there. <laughs>